All right, good morning. I'm, I'm going by the clock in the theatre here, yeah? so uh, that's when I aim to start and stop. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, first of all, just remind you about the, that hit squad waiting to tear people limb from limb by four separate horses. That's only for people whose telephones ring. Um, secondly, can I just say, uh, I. I, I like being interrupted, so if you have a question that occurs to you during the course of the lecture, you know, please put your hand up and you know, ask it. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, I like to leave time at the end for questions, but I very often don't manage it, so if you have a question, by all means ask it in mid-flow. And thirdly, um, I know that lots of you have asked me about the little booklets that I sometimes produce to sort of supplement the course. They should be on sale from tomorrow after the lecture. Uh, and uh, they're on their way, and they should be available from Wednesday midday. OK. Right, well. The subject of yesterday's lecture, Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible, died in 1584, and almost a century elapsed before the subject of today's lecture, Peter I, became co czar in 1682. And in those hundred years, Russia had consolidated some of its gains in the East but it was fighting for its life in the West, where two new powerful states had joined Russia's traditional enemies, and they were the so-called Commonwealth of Poland and the Kingdom of Sweden. We'll come back to them in a minute. Now, this family tree, uh, it seemed to me when I went back that it was legible from the back, I hope it is. Uh, no, not entirely? OK, well, uh, I'll try and point out what needs to be pointed out. Um, because the family tree makes it clear, you know, what a very complex bloodline the so-called Romanovs were. And Ivan's line, Ivan the Terrible, that had died out with the death of his feeble-minded son, Feodor, in 1598. And the 15 years after Feodor's death was so chaotic that they're still known in Russia as the time of the troubles. And when you think what troubles Russia's been through in the last 100 years, the times of the troubles must have been something special. There were five changes of Tsar from four different families. There were two false claimants to the throne. There was a calamitous famine from which it said that one third of the population died of starvation. Moscow was twice occupied by Polish armies. And the time of the troubles was brought to an end when the boyars, whose quarrels and greed had largely caused the troubles, elected the 16-year-old Michael Romanov to the throne. And uh, as I said yesterday, this is an artist's representation, really. We don't really know what Michael Romanov looked like. This may have been based on hearsay or witness statements. Um, 
But the reason I've chosen this particular one is because it shows him as a young man, you know, just past boyhood, really. And he was 16 years old when he became, when he was elected Tsar. Uh, but as I say, this portrait is not uh, an, uh, an exact representation. Anyway, Michael's 32-year-old uh, reign was largely peaceful, a rare event, as was the 31-year-old reign, 31-year reign of his son Alexis. And here's Tsar Alexis, uh, and this also is an artist's representation. However, going back to the family tree, Alexis, um, his first marriage produced two sickly sons, Feodor and Ivan. Can you see that right at the top of the tree? And his second marriage produced, his first wife died, uh, his second marriage produced a vigorously healthy son, Peter. And on Alexis' death, the two surviving half-brothers, 16-year-old Ivan and 10-year-old Peter, were named as co-Zars. Okay? And what this meant was a power struggle between Ivan's mother's family and Peter's mother's family. Now, for a while, Ivan's family was triumphant, and the dominant figure in this struggle was his half-sister, <laughs> Sophia. The French ambassador described her as immensely fat, with a head as large as a bushel, hairs on her face, tumours on her legs, and at least 50 years old. Actually, she was only 31. <laughs> now, she had 40 of Peter's family hacked to pieces in front of Peter and his mother, and most of them were killed by throwing them from staircases onto a forest of spears. Peter's uncle had his hands and feet chopped off with axes, the rest of his body cut into pieces, and the remains trampled into the blood in Red Square. Not surprisingly, it left Peter with an abiding hatred of both the boyars and of Moscow. Seven years later, the ambitious and power-hungry Sophia attempted to have herself crowned sole ruler. Peter and his mother had to flee from Moscow in their nightclothes. But Sophia's plot backfired and Peter's supporters were able to send her to a convent, and this portrait shows her in the convent. Uh, and here the convent is, the Novodevichy convent, which many of you, if you've been to Moscow, will, be, will have seen. It's one of the showpieces of Moscow, stunningly beautiful place. And this is where Sophia was imprisoned for the rest of her life, actually. Ten years later, the Streltsy, who were a sort of semi-official militia, a bit like the Oprichniki, they attempted an uprising in Sophia's name while Peter was out of the country. It was ruthlessly, ruthlessly suppressed and the corpses of the rebels were hung outside Sophia's window for a whole winter. And here you see on the portrait, you can actually see through the lead-paned window the corpse of one of the conspirators, you know, dangling in the air for the whole of the winter. Now that was really the last chapter of Peter's very precarious ascent to the throne. And one of the most remarkable things about his reign was that he survived to ascend the throne at all. Until his feeble-minded and sickly half-brother Ivan died in 1698, Peter was only co -zar, and he was always very respectful and very protective of Ivan's rights. But from 1689, he was effectively in charge. He proved to be one of the most original minds ever to have sat on a throne anywhere. And I'm a huge admirer of him simply for the personal achievement that he brings to this story. He had virtually no formal education, uh, no mentoring or monitoring, 
um, actually no child care at all. And basically, he educated himself through play and through an insatiable innate curiosity. After Sophia's coup in 1682, in other words, seven years before he becomes Tsar, or seven years before he actually assumes control, Peter and his mother had been banished from the Kremlin to the village, which is now a Moscow suburb, of Preobrazhensko. And there Peter started a play army out of other children, servants, and local friends. Now, princes have often indulged in play armies, but not many of them get round to hiring experts to advise them on tactics and even introducing artillery and cavalry. And soon the original 100 expanded to 300 and eventually to 1,000. And they were divided into two regiments, which fought mock battles against each other, in which there were always some casualties and even deaths. And these became the nucleus of the two crack regiments in the Russian armies. Uh, but the wonderful and typically Petrine feature was that Peter enrolls in his own army, not as a commander, but first as a drummer and then as a bombardier. He couldn't have been a commander because he didn't have the necessary expertise. And for that, he found his way to the nearby so-called German Quarter, which was a suburb of Moscow, which was almost reserved for foreigners. Actually, only a few of its inhabitants were Germans, but the Russians called them all Nemtsi, which means Germans now, because they couldn't distinguish between all these foreign languages. And there Peter found an assortment of adventurers, soldiers of fortune, some of whom were seeking political asylum, and some who thought they could earn a fast buck in Russia. They were merchants, artists, doctors, engineers, craftsmen, mercenaries, anything and everything, overwhelmingly Protestant and collectively a breath of fresh air. These were people bringing skills to Russia which the Russian people had really no knowledge of. Peter found them irresistibly fascinating, and from them he claimed to have become proficient in 14 trades, including dentistry. It was a very dangerous admission to complain of a toothache in the Tsar's presence. And it was one step on the way to thinking, on Peter's way to thinking, that everything Asiatic and Russian was bad, everything European and Western was good. So, inspired by these visitors, Peter began importing foreign goods, mathematical instruments, two globes, a large organ, five kegs of Rhine wine, a barrel of olive oil, and an astrolabe. No one knew how to work the astrolabe, so Peter was introduced to a Dutch builder called Franz Timmerman, and Peter immediately appointed him as a royal tutor. And they may have been together in 1688 when they found on their wanderings the decayed hulk of a small English sailing boat. No one knew what it was doing 500 miles from the sea. Peter was infatuated with it. Another Dutchman restored it and taught Peter how to sail it. And from that point on, ships and the water became the overriding obsession of Peter's life. And this boat is still on show in Moscow, in the museum just next to, the, sorry, in St. Petersburg, uh, just next to the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul. And it's labeled the grandfather of the Russian Navy because effectively that's what it was. And whether this is the actual boat or not, you know, we have to take a few sort of uh, liberties here, but they claim that it is. And many of these foreigners in the so-called German suburb were co-opted into another of Peter's inventions. And this is another very typical sort of Petrine invention. It was a club called the All-Joking, All-Drunken Synod of Fools and Jesters. It involved the most prodigious amounts of alcohol. 
and some massively hedonistic partying. But, as with everything Peter did, there was another side to the drunken synod. They elected a prince pope, cardinals, bishops, and a mock czar, who was, of course, never Peter himself. And they enacted meticulously choreographed orgies, which mocked the court and church rituals. And it might, it might sound like the worst kind of hooliganism, but you, can you see it had the very serious effect or purpose of allowing people to mock outdated traditions and to question their current usefulness. So it was a very good kind of way of letting off steam. And for 10 years after he became the real ruler of Russia at the age of 16, he was content to leave the actual administration in the hands of others. He never had that paranoia which intimidated other czars from leaving their capital in case they were ousted in a coup d'etat. He was, in fact, the first Russian czar ever to go abroad. And in 1697, at the age of 25, he set off on an extraordinary voyage of discovery called the Great Embassy. And the mission of the Great Embassy was twofold. One was to strengthen alliances against the Turks and the Swedes, who were his current number one enemies. And the other was to acquire the learning of the West in 15 months. So he is away from Russia for 15 months. And he chose, or he takes with him, 250 delegates in a thousand sledges. And another wonderfully Petrine thing, he chooses to travel incognito under the name Peter Mikhailov. Now, at six foot eight, which he was, with a convulsive nervous tick and a retinue of 250, there was no chance of going undetected. But can you see what it does? It means that he doesn't have to waste time worrying about formal re receptions and sort of time-wasting ceremonies. It's another wonderful idea. And incidentally, it was then copied by all the other rulers of Europe when they wanted to travel in similar ways. And here is Peter at the age of 25. Um, this is the first portrait of a czar which was actually painted from life. And interestingly, you can see it's been painted by a Dutch painter working in England. Uh, Godfrey Kneller. And the fact was that there were no art, no portrait painters in Russia. And interestingly, there were almost no portrait painters in England either. And all the great portrait painters who worked in England, you know, people like Van Dyck and Holbein and those sort of people, they were all foreigners. And here's Kneller, uh, and he's a Dutchman who's come to make his name in England, and he paints Peter when he comes to England. And someone who met Peter in 1697 described him as of very great stature, stout rather than thin, in aspect between proud and grave. He has a great vivacity of mind and a ready and just repartee. It could just be wished that his manners were a little less rustic. <laughs> Fourteen years later, the same observer at a formal dinner, commented favorably on how much his manners had improved. He wrote, he never once belched or farted or picked his teeth as far as I saw or heard. <laughs> and another one said that the nervous, he has a nervous tick which betrays a very hot temper and soon inflamed, brutal in his passion. At times, it was a mere tremor and others a convulsion of his whole left side, rolling his eyes until only the whites were visible and occasionally losing consciousness. And we, we expect that this is a form of epilepsy, a mild form of epilepsy. But generally, people liked Peter, in spite of being nervous of his dangerously low flashpoint. And his most remarkable quality was his titanic energy, he was in perpetual motion, unable to sit still for a moment. 
However, his hosts were supposed to take his incognito so far and no further. In Riga, which incidentally was where my father was born, just giving you these snippets as they come up, um, the Swedish governor took Peter Mikhailov at face value and made no special arrangements to receive him and refused to let him inspect the fortifications. Peter never forgot or forgave that insult. When he reached Vienna 15 months later, the Emperor Leopold said to him at a masked ball, I believe you know the Tsar of Russia. Let us drink to his health. <laughs> that was how you were supposed to treat this masquerade. Peter's first extended stop was, as you would imagine, in Holland, where he wanted to learn the art of shipbuilding. And in Zandam, he was allocated a tiny house, which he had to leave after a week. Here it is. Not because it was too, uh, its six-foot ceilings were too uncomfortable, but because he'd become too much of a curiosity for tourists and sightseers. So he moved out of that house, and that house has now been preserved, uh, and it's on show in a museum at Zandam. And the Dutch East India Company al allowed what they called the distinguished personage living incognito <laughs> and ten companions to work on their shipyards. And Peter was far from a token presence. He wielded the hammer and the saw as diligently as any of the craftsmen. Holland was his first introduction to European manners and the orderly, canalized Dutch townscape became his model uh, for the new city that he was planning to build. He went to Professor Reich's anatomical lectures and developed a taste for dissections and autopsies, which he liked to practice when given the opportunity. He copied inventions like the fire hose, indispensable in a wooden city like Moscow. When he returned to Russia, he set up a fire department in which he enrolled as a fireman himself and insisted on drawing his salary. This is all of a piece with his very extraordinary mentality. From Holland, he moved on to England, where he visited more shipyards and artillery sheds, but also the Royal Observatory, the Royal Mint, the University of Oxford, and the House of Commons. And here he is at Deptford, which was the naval yard on the Thames. And he's not the figure in the uh, black hat and walking stick. That is William III, King William III, William of Orange, in other words. He is the sort of chap with his hand on his knee, wielding the saw on the left-hand side of the picture. Can you all see? Um, and. Uh, at the Inns of Court, when he reached the Inns of Court in London, he asked, who are all those people in black gowns and wigs? And what were they about? They are lawyers, sir. Lawyers, Peter exclaimed. I have but two in my whole dominion, and I shall hang one of them the moment I get home. <laughs> At Portsmouth, Peter was keen to see an example of the brutal punishment of scaffolding. Unfortunately, there was no one at the moment who deserved such a punishment. Peter readily offered one of his own men, <laughs> but was very disappointed to be told that, that your majesty's men are in England now, and hence under the protection of our laws. So in the significance of its results and their impact on world history, Peter's grand embassy is on a par with Columbus's voyage to America. And on the very day he returned, he made clear his total reorientation of Russian life by ordering his boyars to cut off their beards. Until then, the Orthodox Church had enforced the wearing of beards, and it decreed that man was made in the image of God with a beard, not like cats dogs or monkeys. Peter believed, however, 
that they symbolized and reinforced the prejudice and backwardness of Russia. If the boyars protested, he cut off their beards himself. And this is a contemporary, very unusual, a contemporary picture of Peter cutting off the beard of a boyar. And next he attacked their long flowing robes and conical hats, claiming that they were of Tartar rather than Muscovite origins. And urban men and women were ordered to wear what was called German dress, but you, I mean by that they just mean Western dress. And here were the uh, kind of costumes that the boyars wore before now. Uh, in fact, they were actually quite, uh, they'd been quite elaborately simplified by his father Alexei, because Alexei said the problem with the previous costumes was that they couldn't walk in them. Seems reasonable enough. Anyway, that was a simplified version. They're now ordered to wear, as he puts it, German dress. Next, Peter decreed that the year would henceforth begin in January and not in September, as was the practice in the Byzantine Empire. Once again, the church resisted the change because, as they put it, God would not have made the earth in the depth of winter. <laughs> Peter demonstrated with a globe that elsewhere in the world it had been midsummer and won the point. Next, he followed the example of the royal mint and replaced the oval silver copex with round copper coins. He relaxed the church's ban on smoking and made tobacco a state monopoly. He forbade the boyars to address him as his slaves and to prostrate him themselves in his presence. I mean, you could just the, what's fascinating, I think, about this is the glimpse into what an old-fashioned society it was that he took over. Um, he said that they did no longer need to prostrate themselves in his presence. He banned the requirements to take off their hats when passing a royal palace. He said, less civility, more zeal in service, more loyalty to me and the state. That is the respect which should be paid to the Tsar. He tried to encourage education by any means he can, he could. One uh, idea he had was making it a requirement to have a school leaving certificate in order to get married. Uh, it didn't work, I may say. He set up the Moscow School of Mathematics and Navigation, but he had to get a Scot, Henry Farquharson, uh, to head it. And in the last year of his reign, when he set up the Academy of Sciences, all the first academicians were foreigners. So in other words, we're still looking at a very backward society. And when General Trubetskoy returned to Russia in 1715, after 11 years imprisonment in Sweden, his daughters had had, had such a superior education that they were the toast of Russian society. So you can see there's a lot of work to be done. In fact, it even makes me think sometimes how amazing it was that the Russians had got as far as they had before his reign, considering how far behind they were. Peter tried to make Western customs habitual. For example, in 1714, Russian women still blackened their teeth because, once again, the church pronounced that only blackamoors and monkeys had white teeth. Seven years later, travelers reported that the custom was now obsolete. And the nobility who were forced into building palaces in his new capital even had their furnishing and their guest lists checked by the police. And Peter had always said that if need be, he would drag Russia kicking and screaming into the 18th century. And by and large, that was what he did and that was how he did it. And it did achieve, in 25 years, one of the most comprehensive changes in the mentality of any nation in history. It was an uncomfortable transformation for most of Russian society. And it was paid for by a huge increase in taxes, mostly indirect taxes on almost every imaginable commodity but most profitably, following European models, on alcohol, wheat, and above all, salt. 
and the worst affected were, as ever, the poor. Serfs lost their right to change their masters at Michaelmas, which until then, a serf had always had the right to change his master on Michaelmas Day. That was abolished. They were subjected to a poll tax. Their rights to travel were restic restricted, and many of them were forced into seasonal work in the new factories and mines. And it was said of Russia in Peter's reign, as it was said again in Stalin's time, that the people withered while the state thrived. And Peter certainly imposed a crushing weight of taxation. But at his death, the state owed not a penny and had borrowed not a penny. And all Peter's grandiose schemes had been achieved in one generation. Now, of all Peter's schemes, the most grandiose and the most enduring was the creation of a new capital city. And what Peter wanted, as he put it, was a window on the west. So the bizarre illogicality was created of a state which stretched 9,000 kilometers, being governed from its western extremity. And it had to be a port, so Peter was reduced to building it on the only strip of Russian coast which was not on the Arctic Sea, and that was one that he actually won from the Swedes in 1704. Can you all see Petersburg on the map there? Um, and that was the only site available uh, for Peter to build his capital, a bleak and marshy spot on the confluence of two rivers. And the only way to build it was, like Venice, on piles driven into the ground. And the key ingredient in the building of this city was a heroic allocation of labor. Peter ordered a yearly conscription of 40,000 serfs, one conscript for every nine to 16 households. And conscripts had to provide their own tools and food for the journey, uh, a journey sometimes of hundreds of kilometers, on foot, in gangs, often escorted by military guards and shackled to prevent desertion. And once they were in St. Petersburg, thousands, some say as many as 40,000, died from disease and exposure to the harsh conditions. And once the town planning was complete, a thousand noble families were ordered to relocate to St. Petersburg and build a house in what he put called the English style, and of course, to pay for it themselves. And his chief coup was in persuading the Italian-Swiss architect Domenico Trezzini to oversee the building works. And Trezzini's appointment continued a long tradition by which most of Russia's great buildings had been built by Italians. And Trezzini was responsible for almost all the early great buildings, for instance, the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul, the Twelve Colleges Building, the Summer Palace, and the Alexander Nevsky Monastery. Trezzini designed all of these buildings. But even better than that, all new buildings had to be submitted to Trezzini for approval before they could be built. And the result of that was, as many of you will have seen for yourself, one of the most homogenous townscapes in the whole of Europe. I mean, there are very few false sort of notes in the townscape of St. Petersburg. The, probably the most famous is the Cathedral of the Spilled Blood, which is a sort of um, Muscovite uh, fantasy, you know, where, on the site of where Alexander II was assassinated. Um, and this was the mo this was the model or the image which Peter had in mind, and basically this was what, what gets constructed. And Peter pours love and energy into his pet project, as he put it, his paradise, his darling. In the first year, he ordered thousands of flowers, especially those with scent. He ordered 5,000 lime trees from Holland, and every householder had to plant maples. He himself lived in a little log cabin 
while supervising the works, and that log cabin is still pre preserved in St. Petersburg, and you can visit it yourselves. Uh, and when they were completed, when the works were completed, he moved into an exquisite but small 16-room palace designed by Trezzini, which was surrounded by massively larger mansions. And in 1716, he had another triumph when he lured to St. Petersburg Jean-Baptiste Le Blonde, a pupil and associate of André Le Notre, who designed the gardens at Versailles. And Le Blonde laid out the summer gardens and uh, the Nevsky Prospect, and he made the original designs for Peter's country palace at Peterhof. Um, how many of you have seen this? Good, because it's worth seeing. Um, I remember when our guide took us round, he said that uh, Peter's aim was to outdo Versailles. And I said to the guide, in a sort of uh, conciliatory way, I, I said, I thought he had outdone Versailles. It was much more beautiful. And the guide was so pleased with this recommendation, you know, as though it justified the whole enterprise. But Peter also tried to make his new capital a place to be proud to live in. He established an efficient police force, refuse collection, street lighting, which he copied from Amsterdam, drainage, paving, care for beggars, and protection for widows and orphans. And interestingly, in 1710, seven years after its foundation, the English ambassador described it as a heap of villages. Ten years later, he called it a wonder of the world. However, its greatest glories actually lay further ahead in the reigns of two empresses under the hands of another Italian, Francesco Rastrelli, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. However, if Russia had had no more than a window on the West, Peter's ambitions would have taken much longer to fulfill. As soon as Peter had developed his obsession with ships, he started looking around for somewhere to use them, obvious. And the only possible place in his kingdom was the port of Archangel on the White Sea, which was icebound for six months of the year. And uh, Peter visited at least four times, and in 1693, when he was 21 years old, he ordered the construction of new shipyards there. But he had his eye on bigger prizes. And on his southern border, the Turks and their Tartar subordinates controlled the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. Do you see them? Black Sea, Sea of Azov. These were in Turkish hands at the time. Uh, and of course, the Sea of Azov has recently become rather topical uh, with the Russian Navy seizing some Ukrainian boats that were trying to get into it, as they should have been allowed to, of course. In 1695, the Russians launched an attack on the Sea of Azov, Peter himself serving as a bombardier in the Preobrazhensky Guards. An attempted siege failed. Peter blamed the failure on an inability to disrupt the Turkish supply lines at sea. A massive naval building campaign resulted. A Dutch galley was cut into sections as a prototype. And a year later, the siege was renewed, this time successfully. 6,000 colonists were sent to Azov. 20,000 Ukrainian laborers were dispatched to build a naval harbor at Taganrog. And Taganrog is not marked on this map, but it's just immediately west of Rostov on Don there. And the result was an even greater splurge of shipbuilding. The state would build 10 ships. Every great landowner would build one ship, of course, at their expense. Every monastery would build one ship. The Moscow merchants complained that 12 ships were too many, so it was increased to 14. <laughs> 60 expert shipwrights were imported from Europe. 60 Russians were sent abroad to study seamanship. But this is a typically sort of Petrine contrivance. They had to finance their own travel and return on pains of death 
with certificates of competency. One can see that sharing Peter's obsessions and dreams was not an easy ride. In 1700, the Turks struck back and reclaimed all their previous losses. So Peter's first foray into foreign politics was no great success. However, on his northwestern border, advisers convinced him that Sweden was a softer target. And here is the Swedish Empire in the 17th century, which briefly became a sort of great power in European terms. Um, and under the Vasa kings, Sweden had flourished in the 17th century, mopping up the east coast of the Baltic, as you can see, uh, really takes up the whole of the Baltic coast as far as Kurland, which was part of Lithuania, um, and in the process making enemies of the Poles, the Danes, the Prussians, and the Russians. So Peter now declares war, still smarting from his cold reception in Riga, do you remember? And citing the usual excuses about the restoration of ancient Russian lands. And the point was, there were so many changes of ownership in this region that everyone could claim that lands were ancient ancestral lands. And it was a good time for an attack on Sweden. The throne had just passed to a... Well, here we have a... Yeah, the Swedish ex imperial expansion, sort of slightly more technicolor. Um, and uh, um, you can see that they even have sort of outposts on the co coast of Germany. They look small, but those outposts, as you can see, are at the mouths of all the great Baltic rivers. Very important possessions. Um, and as I say, the, the throne of Sweden had just passed to a 15-year-old boy, Charles XII. Now, if you think Peter sounds something like a, but somewhere between a genius and a lunatic, Charles makes him seem almost normal. And for his whole life, Charles abstained from alcohol and sex, showed a superhuman indifference to pain and discomfort, seemed totally devoid of emotion, and was in love with war. But he wasn't just in love with it, he had a spectacular, unique talent for it. And at the first encounter between the Swedes and the Russians, although outnumbered four to one, the 18-year-old Charles, as he then was, inflicted a crushing defeat on the Russians. All the Russian artillery was lost, the cavalry was routed, thousands of prisoners were taken. But the trouble with geniuses is that things come too easily to them. They sometimes think that they don't need to take normal precautions. And Charles Annan assumed that the Russians were too weak to warrant serious attention, so he turned south to deal with the Poles. And with invariably smaller forces, he dealt the Poles an equally crushing defeat and installed a puppet king on the Polish throne. It was time now for this self-appointed agent of God's will to turn his attention to Russia, saying, it will be needful for me to march thither and depose Peter also. As many invasions of, Russians of Russia often do, the campaign started well with another sensational victory against huge odds, but it tempted Charles to march east to Moscow and his army suffered ambushes and shortages, and they decided to turn south. A year later, his army was reduced to 23,000 men. A third of his infantry had been lost, and Charles himself was in and out of a coma, resulting from an infected wound in his foot. And the Russians caught up with him at a place called Poltava, 2,500 kilom kilometers from his capital in Stockholm, which is where I was born, um, but you can see Poltava on the map there, yes? And of course you have to ask, what on earth is Charles doing there? You know, he is just miles away from his base. And when the Russians catch up with him, uh, the Swedes fought well, but they were massively outnumbered. And Peter, as ever, reacts to victory in his own way. At the victory feast, 
at which the captured Swedish generals were present, he proposed a toast to his teachers in the art of war. Who are your masters? asked the Swedish commander. Why, you are, replied Peter. Typical sort of Petrine exchange. Amazingly, Charles escaped into Turkey, where he remained for five years. And when he was free to return, he immediately resumed war with the Danes, where he was killed either by a sniper or by someone on his own side, often thought to be. And when Peter heard the news, he said tearfully, my dear Charles, how much I pity you, and immediately ordered a week's mourning. You know why he does this? You know, I mean, he's just such an unpredictable, but a sort of totally spontaneous life force. And Poltava was the turning point in what's known as the Great Northern War. And the Russians, here's a uh, painting of the Battle of Poltava by a Flemish artist who came to work in St. Petersburg, and he painted it the year after Peter's death. Uh, so it's not exactly contemporary, but quite close. Um, and in the last phases of the Northern War, um, the Russians um, take uh, re the cities of Reval and Viborg. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got the pointer. Can you see where they are? Reval is on the northern coast of Estonia, and Viborg is on the southern coast of Finland. And Peter described those as the two cushions on which St. Petersburg can rest in tranquility. And it gave Russia the coastline, which opened Russia to European trade and ideas. And Europe was very fully aware of the significance of this change. Suddenly, there was a flurry of diplomatic marriages between European rulers and Russian princes and princesses. And before Peter, Russia had had only one embassy in Warsaw. By 1725, it was accredited in every court in Europe. And Peter now modestly accepted the title, The Great. And in keeping with his drive for westernization, he exchanged the title of Tsar for Emperor. And as was truly said, the steppe period, period of the steppes, of Russian, period, of Russian history was ended, and the maritime period now began. And it's arguable that no one did more than Peter to make Russia great. It was an extraordinary achievement by an extraordinary person. Peter had been married off at the age of 16 to a wife whom he almost immediately had secured in a nunnery. And instead, he took up with the daughter of a Dutch wine merchant from the German quarter. But at the age of 32, he discarded her in favor of Martha Skowronska, who was a Lithuanian peasant girl who'd been captured in the Livonian War. And uh, uh, this is by um, Jean um, Monique Natier when they visited France in 1717, and he paints uh, a portrait of Peter at the same time. Um, and um, Martha had worked as a washerwoman and a scullery maid, never learned how to read or write, and her portraits do not make her look irresistible, but she must have been. It was the most successful relationship of Peter's life. They stayed together until he died. She was a moderating influence on his temper. When he smashed vases, shouting, thus can I destroy the most beautiful object in my palace, she would reply calmly, and have you made the palace more beautiful by doing so? <laughs> by his first wife, Peter had a son, Alexis, with whom, in time-honored Russian tradition, Peter had a violent relationship. And, uh, sorry, uh, and here's Tsar Alexis, and Peter ranted and raved at Alexis's lack of discipline and ambition. He tried to saddle him with various responsibilities, but Alexis couldn't cope with them. And of course, I feel very sorry for Alexis because it's very difficult to be the son of any great man like this, as history keeps on demonstrating again and again. Um, eventually, Peter demanded that Alexis either resign his rights 
or retire to a monastery. Alexia said, fine, I'll choose the monastery. Peter refused to allow him to do that. Um, Alexis became identified with the political opposition. So Peter had him interrogated and tortured. And this was another episode which fascinated the 19th century uh, history painters. And no hard evidence was revealed, but the Senate voted by 127 votes to none for the death penalty. And two days later, Alexius was dead, popularly believed to have been strangled by Peter himself. Um, by Martha, Peter had 12 children, of whom only two survived to adulthood. And when the eldest, Peter, died at the age of four, Peter had a total collapse. He barricaded himself in his, himself in his rooms, refusing even to see Martha. And the business of state went unattended. And eventually, the oldest of the boyars battered his door, saying, your excessive and useless sorrow is ruining the country. Was he executed on the spot? Not a bit. P Peter comes out meekly, saying, you're quite right. We have afflicted ourselves for too long. And finally, a life as extraordinary as Peter's deserved and got, if contemporary accounts are to be believed, an equally extraordinary death. He had recently recovered from a bladder infection when he went to review some uh, ironworks on the Gulf of Finland. There he saw some soldiers drowning just offshore. So, in mid-November, on the Baltic coast. What does a 52-year-old Tsar with health problems do in such a situation? Well, he wades in to the icy waters and he rescues the soldiers. And that reactivates his previous condition and he's rushed back to his sickbed. Now, the succession to the throne uh, is far from straightforward and we'll come back to that again tomorrow. But provision has been made for that. And three years later, Peter had passed a law of succession entitling the sovereign to nominate his successor. And actually, it's worth noting that, in fact, none of the 18th century czars achieved their position in this way, although that was, in fact, the law. So, Peter has the... Uh, law of succession in his hands. On his deathbed, he's given pen and paper, and he begins to scrawl, I leave all to... when suddenly he dies. <laughs> One often hears the phrase, you couldn't make it up. But I can't think of many historical characters to whom that applies more truly than to Peter. Okay, that's my bit. Okay. Well, we have got fun. Yeah. They're, they're, they're built on wooden piles. Yeah. Like Venice. And I, I, they, don't, they don't rot. Not if they're underwater, apparently. I don't understand this, but you know, there are no doubt many engineers here who can explain it. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Well, it, they, they didn't actually destroy any of the great palaces, and they, didn't, uh, they got to the Catherine Palace, if you remember, uh, which is in, Peter, uh, in Tsarsko Salo, next to Peterhof, and they uh, raided the Amber Room, but they didn't actually destroy the palace. Um, the Catherine Palace? Not totally. No. Well, they may have damaged it, shall we say, but uh, the structure was left sort of intact. Uh, 
Sorry, yeah. 